Howdy, howdy, this is Mr. Potter, and welcome to day one of our lessons on continuity. Uh, today's going to be pretty intensive with definitions because we have a lot of different types of continuity to talk about. We need to talk about continuity at an interior point, at an endpoint on an interval, uh, continuity on its own domain, and of course when a function is just continuous. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I need to talk about is continuity at a point. And there are really three things that we need to look at here. The first thing is I need to make sure that the limit as x approaches some point c exists. So in other words, I should actually have a number l when I complete this. The second thing that I need is I need to make sure that my function is actually defined at that point. In other words, if I substitute c into my function, I get a value m. And the third point for continuity, this really is the key, is that these numbers really need to be the same. So in other words, I need to make sure that I have a limit, and my function's defined, and that defined point actually fills the hole. That's what I need for continuity. And this gives me continuity at any interior point. The only thing that could cause some problems is this step if I'm dealing with an endpoint, because I could have a situation where I'm at the endpoint of some interval, and I want to prove do I have continuity here. So in this particular case, I need to make sure that my one-sided limit, either my left-hand limit or my right-hand limit, exists. So it's got, that's got to be equal to L, or the limit as x approaches c if I'm looking at the right side of an interval of f of x equals l. So I need to make sure that this takes the place of what we had talked about before with the limit existing because that's what I'm going to need for an endpoint. I'm only going to have one-sided limits. The other limit won't exist. The second thing I need to make sure of course is that f of c actually gives me a value and step 3 is that this L and this M are the same y-coordinate. And that allows me to fill the hole in this endpoint situation. So this allows me to talk about continuity at any point, whether it's an interior point on an interval or whether it's an endpoint on an interval. So I do want to talk about when does continuity fail. And of course, keep in mind, because there are three steps, there are three ways that continuity can fail. Remember, the first step is dealing with a limit, so I need to talk about when does a limit exist, or rather, when does a limit not exist. And there are three situations that we've talked about where I could have a situation where a limit does not exist. This kind of jump discontinuity, where I've got the function defined at a point, but my left and right hand limits aren't the same. I do have a left and right hand limit, they're just not equal, and so the limit at that point does not exist. I could also have an asymptotic situation, kind of like the y equals 1 over x squared, where here the positive y-axis acts as an asymptote, so I don't have a left hand limit or a right hand limit at x equals 0, so I can't define the limit at x equals 0. And there is a third case that's a little bit more peculiar. If I was to take a look at the function y equals the sine of 1 over x and try and figure out what's happening to this as x approaches 0 from the positive side, the thing is, if I'm dealing with values that would make sine 0 like 1 over pi, or 2 over pi, or 3 over pi, or 4, or excuse me, 1 over 2 pi, 1 over 3 pi, 1 over 4 pi, I end up with a situation where this function oscillates an infinite number of times as I get closer and closer to the y-axis. And so I can't say that this limit exists because it actually fails by something called oscillation. The idea is that it takes on this y value somewhere between here and here an infinite number of times. This actually fails the epsilon delta notation that we talked about in our first lesson. So these are the three situations that we arise when a limit does not exist. The second step is I need to know when does f of c not exist. And again, 
When f of c doesn't exist, those are the situations where I have an unfilled hole. The limit exists, but the point's not defined. Uh, there are also some situations where I could look at the boundary points of, say, a semicircle. And of course, I could run into some problems if those points happen to be in the denominator because I'm not allowed to divide by zero. So I could have a situation like this where these endpoints don't exist, even though the limits, the left side limit and the right side limit, do exist. And then, of course, I've got my third step. When are they not the equal? In other words, I know that I have a limit, and I know that I have a point defined. My point definition just may be much higher or much lower than my function. So these are descriptions, visual descriptions of what happens when continuity fails. What we're often going to be asked in this class, though, is how do we fill a hole? The idea is that we're going to have some function that's defined piecewise, where I have a function that has a clear issue at one particular point. For example, at x equals 2, I have a common factor in the numerator and denominator. They divide out. So I actually do have a hole here. The question is, what value of k would I need to define at x equals 2 so that the hole gets filled? And in essence, what I'm asking here is to find k, k needs to be this limit as x approaches my value of my function. And of course, this is a limit like we've been solving uh, since day one in this class. The idea is that I need to factor the numerator and factor the denominator. The limit as x approaches 2, uh, this factors out to x minus 2 squared. And the denominator is difference of squares, so that's x minus 2 and x plus 2. And because I do have a common factor in the numerator and denominator, that factor will eliminate. And so now I can evaluate this limit by substitution. I can substitute into the reduced rational function. And I end up with 2 minus 2, which is 0, over 2 plus 2, which is 4. So I need to define k to be 0 in order to fill this hole. And so what happens is I've got a function that does something like this, and I had a hole here at the point to 0, but I've now filled that hole. Now, I am kind of ignoring what happens at x equals negative 2, because I've got an asymptote there, and that is a non-removable discontinuity. But the reason that we call this situation where I have a hole, but the left and right limits are the same, the reason we call this a removable discontinuity is because I can set up a piecewise function. I can set up a value of k for that particular x value, and solve for k using the limit process. So I can actually define some value of k when x is at my trouble spot to fill this hole. In other words, to make my function a continuous function. And, and some books call this completing a function. But basically what we're doing is we're removing a removable discontinuity. So we have this concept of continuity at a point, dealing with either an interior point or dealing with a boundary point. And we've talked about how to resolve the situation if I've got a removable discontinuity and I want to make this a continuous function. So then the question is, well, how do I talk about uh, continuous on some interval? And of course, I know how to do continuous at a point, so what I really want to say is f of x is continuous at every point on the interval. from A to B. In other words, I can address the boundary points at A, the boundary points at B, and every interior point that lies between A and B. And if I know for a fact that I'm continuous at every one of these points, then I end up being continuous on the interval. And I can see that in the function y equals 1 over x, not at 0, because that's my trouble point, but I definitely could look at it from 1 to 4. 
And the thing is, from here to here, this clearly is a continuous function. So I can say y equals 1 over x is continuous on some closed interval 1, 4. And in fact, it's going to be continuous on any closed interval that does not include 0. As long as I have a left boundary point, a right boundary point, and every point in between, I'm continuous, then it's all good. So this is how we define continuity on an interval. The next thing we have is, how do we define a function is continuous? And, and this seems a little bit nebulous, and I'll talk about why in just a moment. But a continuous function is a function that is continuous on its domain. A continuous function is a function that is continuous on its domain. But this leads to some pretty peculiar things. The idea that y equals 1 over x is a continuous function. And it's continuous because its domain from negative infinity to 0 and from 0 to infinity at every one of these interior points, it's continuous. So it's continuous at every point in its domain. If I were to look at something like y equals tangent x, this is a continuous function. And so, of course, the question is, well, what type of functions would not be continuous? And that would be like the, the step function that we talked about, the greatest integer function. This is not continuous, and the reason it's not continuous is because I end up with these situations where the limit does not exist. It's not the fact that the points are not in the domain. That's not the problem. The problem is the limit not existing at each one of my integral values. So these are going to be the functions that are not continuous, not problems with the domain like tangent or 1 over x. The idea is that I can have those asymptotes and still be dealing with a continuous function on its domain. Of course, what we really are concerned with is, are we continuous on all reals? In other words, are we continuous at every possible, and of course I'm using possible in quotes, point. Because if I look at y equals 1 over x, this is not continuous on the real numbers. And of course, the problem point is x equals 0. Similarly, y equals tan x is not continuous on the real numbers. The problems being x equals the odd values of pi over 2. The values that are not in my domain but as soon as I say, well, am I continuous on all reals? Am I continuous from negative infinity to infinity? Then, well, no, of course not, because I have a discontinuity at x equals 0. I have a discontinuity at these odd multiples of pi over 2 for tangent x. And when we talk about continuity, continuity on the reals is a little bit more important concept than just the concept of, am I continuous at every point in my domain? There are some situations where it's pertinent to talk about, am I continuous on my domain? For example, this greatest integer function. But I'm really interested in, am I continuous on all reals? Or do I have a discontinuity on the real number line? And those often are addressed through issues with my domain, like x equals 0 or x equals odd multiples of pi over 2. So, as I mentioned, this is pretty heavy on the definitions, but we need very precise terminology because the questions we're going to be asked on the AP ask these type of subtle questions. Am I continuous on an interval? Am I continuous at an endpoint? Am I continuous on the reals? Or am I just a continuous function? And we need to understand the difference between each of these terms in order to be successful in the AP exam. So, once again, this is Mr. Potter. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.